Hello, my name is Kevin Kelly, and I'm going to be sharing some recent and ongoing work today regarding measuring the decays of heavy Dirac or Majorana fermions and how to tell the difference between the two of them. This is based on this archive link I've put in the title slide here with my collaborators, Andre de Govea, Patrick Fox, and Boris Kaiser, as well as some ongoing work. So to motivate this work, I wanna ask first the question, why should we think about heavy fermions? specifically heavy neutral fermions? Well, the most uh, reasonable, most compelling motivation that I can think of is the fact that we have neutrinos in the standard model that are fermions that happen to have a very small mass. And some of the simplest extensions of the standard model that explain the lightness of the standard model neutrino masses include things like heavy neutral fermions, often known as right-handed or sterile neutrinos that are uh, standard model gauge singlets. And through the seesaw mechanism or some other physics are responsible for why the standard model neutrinos are so light. Now, to date, uh, these heavy fermions have not been discovered, but if they are discovered, they could have interesting ramifications, not only for the lightness of neutrino masses, but with other physics such as leptogenesis, dark matter, et cetera. There have been a, a large number of experimental pursuits looking for such heavy neutral leptons. What I'm showing here is a summary from this paper from late 2019 that uh, looks for heavy neutrinos as a function of their mass on the x-axis and the mixing between heavy and light neutrinos specifically in the electron flavor on the y-axis, the mixing angle squared. All of the shaded regions are excluded or disfavored by experimental observations. And next generation experiments have the capability of expanding on these in a, a number of ways. What I find very compelling about this figure is that it spans over 12 orders of magnitude in heavy neutrino mass, from EV masses all the way at the left end to greater than TEV masses at the right end. This requires a large number of different experimental pursuits to try to look for such heavy neutrinos from measuring uh, phenomena associated with neutrino oscillations, if these heavy neutrinos are on the EV scale, to measurements of beta decays, uh, searches in accelerators and uh, fixed target experiments, all the way up to the highest energy colliders that we have, for instance, the Atlas detector at the Large Hadron Collider. I'm going to be particularly focused in this GEV, maybe tens of MEV region, where the constraints that are uh, most prevalent come from either searches for direct decays and looking for rare decays of pions or some of these fixed target experiments like uh, T2K in, in this context. Like I said, uh, these currently operating in next generation experiments have the capability of further pushing down in this parameter space, looking for smaller and smaller mixing. And there's the possibility of discovery in the next generation. So if we happen to be lucky enough to discover one of these heavy neutral leptons, there are going to be a, a large number of questions asked. Uh, what are its properties? Does it mix with all three neutrino flavors? Are there more than one of these heavy neutral leptons, et cetera, et cetera. But the most compelling and exciting question to me, which is intimately related to the lightness of the standard model neutrinos, is whether or not this new heavy neutrino is a Dirac or a Majorana fermion how it generates this mass term. An equivalent question that one can ask is whether or not this new particle's interactions conserve or violate lepton number. If, the, if lepton number is good symmetry of nature, then these are Dirac fermions. If it's not, they're Majorana fermions. And so just as a thought experiment, let's set the stage for how one might try to address this question. So let's imagine you have some well-characterized source of heavy neutrinos. For instance, you have a source of only positively charged kaons that can decay into a muon and one of these heavy neutrinos. If this is a, a Dirac fermion, then lepton number is a, a good quantum number. We can assign lepton number plus one to this n, and all of its decays will be into objects with a net lepton number of plus one. For instance, the N will decay to a, a negatively charged muon and a positively charged pion. However, if N is a Majorana fermion, then its decays can violate lepton number. And then N coming from this K plus source can decay instead to a mu plus and a pi minus. 
In fact, if n is a Majorana fermion, this second process will happen with equal probability to the first one. So if we have this perfectly characterized source of only positively charged kaons, then we have a prediction. If n is a Dirac fermion, we should only see final states of decays with a mu minus and a pi plus. Whereas if n is a Majorana fermion, we should see equal rates with mu minuses and mu pluses in the final state. And so if we are lucky enough to detect one of these ends, we can try to measure these two chains and see whether they happen with equal probability or not to determine the character of the end. One uh, next generation experiment that has very good capability of looking for heavy neutral leptons is the Deep Underground Neutrino Experiment, or DUNE. Specifically, it's near detector complex. What I'm showing is a schematic view of this uh, near detector complex and the associated neutrino beam facility where a proton beam with 120 GeV energy strikes a target, negatively, positively, and neutral mesons are produced, for instance, pi plus and pi minus, or kaons, or eta mesons. And magnetic focusing horns can either focus positively charged mesons and defocus negatively charged mesons, or vice versa. This is done for the neutrino facility purposes of DUNE, to sign select uh, neutrinos at the expense of antineutrinos or vice versa. However, it has a side benefit of focusing particles that produce heavy neutral leptons and not their conjugate particles if they are direct fermions. So what can happen? Well, in, in this large decay volume, order 200 meters or so, the charged mesons can decay, for instance, into a muon and a heavy neutral lepton, the process I showed on the previous slide. And depending on the mass and the coupling uh, the heavy neutral leptons can be long-lived. They can be so long-lived that they travel in the direction of the dune near detector complex and decay inside one of the near detectors into a, a visible signature. Uh, I'll direct you to this reference for more on this, but in, in particular, this multi-purpose gaseous argon time projection chamber has excellent capability for detecting decays of new physics particles, especially because of its low-density environment, therefore reducing neutrino backgrounds, and also the fact that it's situated inside a magnetic field. And so measuring the charges of these final state particles is feasible in this volume. What we showed in this paper was that not only can DUNE improve on existing experimental constraints in a, a large range of masses, but depending on what uh, mass and coupling the new particle has, we have a chance of determining whether it's a Dirac or Meyer on a fermion. So shown in this figure here in purple is our expected DUNE capability, the sensitivity to identify one of these heavy neutral leptons, whereas these black lines show regions of parameter space above which we could determine whether it's a Dirac or Majorana fermion at greater than three sigma confidence. Uh, these, this A parameter, A of 0.75 in solid and one in dashed, has to do with how well you identify the charges of those final state particles on an event by event basis. 0.75 means getting that uh, measurement correct 75% of the time, and one means getting it correct 100% of the time. If you only get it right 50% of the time or worse, you're purely guessing, and your sensitivity to direct versus Majorana nature completely is lost. So we think this is very exciting. Uh, via these charge decays, Dune has the capability of finding a new fermion and determining whether it's a Dirac or Majorana particle. So what if we're not lucky? And what if N is light and it can't decay, for instance, into a muon and a pion into one of these fully visible, fully charged final states? For instance, if N is light, then its decays will look like something like N goes to a neutrino and a photon, or N goes to a neutrino and a pion, or n goes to a neutrino and a pair of charged leptons. Because there's a neutrino in the final state, which will go off undetected, the lepton number of the final state is unidentifiable, at least on an event by event basis. So we can't perform this measurement of ratios that I propose. However, there's still hope in determining whether or not n is a Dirac or a Majorana fermion in this case. And that comes from measuring the distribution of outgoing photons or other particles in the decay. So this was proposed a few years ago by uh, Baha Balanthenkin, Andre de Govea, and Boris Kaiser, looking at two body decays of heavy fermions into light neutrinos and a self-conjugate particle called X. What they showed is that if N is a Majorana fermion, this decay has to be isotropic. 
However, if it's a direct fermion and it's a polarized N, then that is not necessarily isotropic. And the level of anisotropy depends on what this N is decaying into. For instance, a photon, a pion, a rho, a Z, or a Higgs. So earlier this year, my collaborators and I explored the possibility of expanding this to three body decays instead of two body decays. Specifically, we focused on N goes to a neutrino and a pair of charged leptons, L alpha and L beta. What we found is that if N is a polarized Majorana fermion, its decays are forward backward symmetric if either of the following cases are true. First, if N is decaying into a pair of uh, identical final state charged leptons, for instance, an electron positron pair. The second instance is where you have a charge blind detector. You can't tell the difference between mu plus and mu minus and or electron positron. Uh, in that case, the decay is forward backward symmetric as well. We did this not only for the standard decays of HNLs via W and Z bosons, but the most generic four fermion operator that you could write down in this structure. So if N is a Majorana fermion, these decays tend to be uh, forward backward symmetric. However, if N is a direct fermion, that's not the case. And we determined the range of how large that forward backward asymmetry can be, depending on these new four fermion operators. For instance, if we restrict ourselves to having only vector and axial vector interactions, the allowed range is shown by these purple regions. The left panel is for the decays of N goes to a neutrino and a pair of charged uh, electrons. And the right panel is going to a muon electron pair. Like I said, the purple region is the full region allowed by generic ve vector axial vector interactions. But if you restrict yourself to N decaying via off-shell W and or Z bosons, the calculation gives you the answers uh, shown in black lines, which tend to be large forward backward asymmetries relative to the zero for Majorana fermions. So is this something that's measurable? Is this something that we can actually observe to distinguish between these two hypotheses? Well, that's what we're addressing in some ongoing work. We're envisioning a post-discovery experiment after one of these ends is detected in a different environment that's purpose-built to study the end properties. And we're determining, for instance, if we have a null hypothesis that N is a Dirac fermion and an alternate hypothesis that it's a Majorana fermion, what level of statistics is required to separate those hypotheses at a statistically significant level, for instance, three sigma? This uh, answer depends on what we assume the interaction structure of the Dirac and decays are. So depending on what we make the assumption of, whether it's, for instance, an N that mixes mostly with nu E or one that mixes mostly with nu mu nu tau, we find that the answer is on the ballpark of 100. It could be as few as maybe 80 or so. Again, this is roughly three sigma separation. So more events would be uh, a more uh, statistically significant statement. The required number of events is even fewer for scalar and pseudoscalar interactions because those predict larger forward backward asymmetries in the direct fermion case. So we think that there's some room for next generation experiments and those that are purpose built for uh, measuring these ends to really hone in on whether N is a direct or Meyer and a fermion and what type of interactions it has in these decays. So to wrap up, these heavy gauge singlet fermions, heavy neutral leptons, sterile neutrinos are exist in many well motivated beyond the standard model theories. Even uh, theories like dark matter include heavy gauge singlet fermions often. And so a bevy of experiments that are ongoing and that are currently in their planning stages have exquisite sensitivity to hopefully discover one of these fermions. If we're lucky enough that we do discover one of these, then I think it's prudent to ask the question now of what do we do after that and how we answer many of these interesting questions, for instance, whether it's a drag or Meyer on a fermion, what type of symmetries it obeys or violates, et cetera. And these purpose-built experiments can really do a lot of work to answer these questions. And one of the key experimental tools of answering the question of Dirac versus Meyer on a fermion is measuring the distribution of decays of these new particles. So I appreciate your attention. Thank you very much for watching my video and I hope to answer as many of your questions as possible during the panel talk. Thank you.